All right, so, uh, hey, how are you, Jess? All right, so let's get started. So uh, I'm Sinan Aral uh, here at the Sloan School at MIT, and on behalf of Eric Brynjolfsson and uh, Sandy Pentland, I want to welcome you formally to MIT and to the Conference on Digital Experimentation. We uh, started this conference three years ago because we believed that experimentation and digital experimentation specifically uh, were going to become <clears throat> even more central uh, in science, in business, in public policy as platforms and APIs became more flexible and amenable to uh, digital experimentation. Uh, and today, experimentation is on the rise, obviously, in, in a number of areas. Scientific studies, as many disciplines, are also simultaneously facing replication crises. Uh, experimentation is, uh, is becoming more and more uh, relied upon uh, to deliver rigor and to deliver nuanced understandings of the data generating processes that underlie the phenomena that we study. In business contexts, as companies, uh, also grapple with how to conduct ethical experiments uh, that the public can trust. And increasingly in public policy, as governments seek to nudge citizens to increase total welfare uh, and well-being, uh, we think that there are tremendous opportunities, and, and there are tremendous opportunities to be sure, to uncover rigorous scientific findings, to create policies that work uh, better because we understand the underlying behavioral mechanisms that drive the societal outcomes that we see. Uh, but there are also important challenges, which is part of the reason why we created this conference. Uh, experiments are getting bigger. Uh, as Susan and I were discussing, we're now more and more exploring heterogeneity and treatment effects. They're getting more complex. We are conducting these experiments, for instance, in networks where interference, statistical interference, is uh, making analysis more challenging. Uh, experiments are also being combined with machine learning and algorithmic thinking, creating challenges of integration and in interpretation. And there are obviously numerous ethical and social welfare implications of experimentation and machine learning that are being debated here uh, and in the world at large. Many of these topics we have covered, as you know, in previous uh, WIN workshops. So we created this to, to bring the top minds in digital experimentation to MIT. Uh, as a summit of sorts to discuss the issues. Uh, and we have had an amazing submission of uh, papers. This year it was a record number of submissions. Having read every single paper that was submitted myself, uh, the quality was incredibly high. I was amazed to see uh, what amazing work everyone in this room is doing. So we're very, very pleased to have you all here. I just want to remind everyone and also, if you're a first-time attendee of the Code Conference, that the format is a little different than other conferences. Uh, we focus on short talks and long discussion. So this isn't intended to be lecture style. It's in the, intended to be about the conversation. And it's also intended to be informal. So you're not going to hear a lot of really long bios being uh, described for every person. Uh, mostly because we wouldn't have enough time in the day for all the amazing uh, invited speakers that we have with us uh, to list all of their accomplishments. So it's just going to be about substance and fun, not about formality and titles and structure. So I want to thank just a few groups before we begin, and then I'll turn it over to Eric to uh, kick us off with the first panel. I want to thank MIT Sloan uh, for all the support they've given us and also for hosting uh, the conference uh, here at the Sandberg Center. I want to thank the Initiative on the Digital Economy, which makes all of this happen. Um, the Initiative on the Digital Economy, led by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee, with a little help from Sandy and I, uh, is really tackling some of the most pressing issues uh, in the digital world today. Uh, and we're really thankful for their support. Uh, for Accenture, uh, who is a founding member of the Initiative on the Digital Economy, for their ongoing support and for their support of the conference. Uh, for Facebook, who is uh, not only a sponsor of the conference, uh, two years running, we greatly appreciate that, but is also uh, 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 highly represented in the substance of the conference with lots of uh, scientists from Facebook submitting and presenting papers. And finally, uh, almost finally, uh, the White House, 
uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as the Social and Behavioral Policy team uh, for all of the great discussions that we had uh, prior to the conference. Um, I want to point out one thing. You were pointed to a, uh, a policy brief and a, and a set of questions from the White House on your way in. This is uh, from Tom Khalil, who's the Deputy, Deputy Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, uh, the, the OSTP, as well as the um, Social and Behavioral Sciences team, are very interested in thinking about these types of questions. So they've got a list of questions uh, and, a, and a brief uh, letter uh, for you to review. Um, uh, and we're, we have representatives uh, from the White House here as well. We're very pleased to have them. And finally, uh, before I turn it over, I'd really like to thank uh, all of the invited speakers uh, who have incredible demands on their schedule. We're very, very pleased to have you with us. And, uh, and so thank, thank you as well to all of you for coming. Uh, without you, there is no code conference. So thanks again. And I will uh, turn it over to Eric to kick us off. Thank you. Let me just uh, very briefly uh, add my welcome to Sinan's and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and I want to emphasize that uh, most of the credit for uh, organizing the success of this belongs to Sinan, who really uh, uh, came up with the idea and has been putting a ton of work into it. And uh, Sandy and I helped out where we could. Um, I want to also underscore uh, Sinan's point about the culture. Uh, there's sometimes a tendency as, uh, as institutions and people get older to become more formal, bureaucratic, uh, embellished, even Baroque, and we want to sort of do a refresh, go back to having a, a, a simpler, cleaner kind of a conference, and uh, that means that the talks I'm going to have, ask each of the uh, speakers to only speak for 15 minutes, and uh, that will leave us a nice 40 minutes for Q&A and discussion, so we're looking forward to all of you being participants in this first session and uh, asking uh, interesting, provocative questions, challenging questions, but also in a spirit of uh, inquiry and support. So uh, let's try and, uh, and have that kind of a culture for not just this first uh, session, but also for the, the entire conference the next couple of days. And with that, let me please ask uh, our first speaker to come up. And we're going to have very short introductions. So please welcome Susan. <laughs> Great, a uh, little loud, there we go. I'm so excited. Um, I love this conference. Um, I am so excited to see all of you here. I think this conference was such an amazing idea and I, I love to be able to learn from all people that I often see only in separate places, um, but all here together. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking specifically about um, some work I've been doing in the area of heterogeneous treatment effects, heterogeneous estimates that's bringing together machine learning and the ability to evaluate um, A-B tests or natural experiments. And one of the things that's so exciting for me about this conference is that when I looked at the program and I saw how many papers there were on the agenda about treatment effect heterogeneity and personalization, where just a couple of years ago, there, there was not a lot of work uh, there at all. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to, to not only talk about this now in this discussion, but also in the next uh, session I'll be moderating. So when we think about um, you know, big data and digital experimentation and so on, one of the things that's most exciting about that is that we have lots of data about people. And often in, when you're doing A-B testing in, an, in a um, technical tech firm environment, you're trying to test out algorithms. And the algorithms themselves are personalized, but one of the kind of schizophrenic parts of it is that the A-B testing platforms were often very, uh, very simplistic. They would have like a single metric of maybe a, a suite of metrics representing different concepts, but often you would just look at like one number, how things did on aggregate. And when, when I was working at Bing Ads in particular, I always found that frustrating because um, different experiments might work for different reasons, and actually whether the, the experiment really was a good predictor of the future partly depended on how it was working. Like if the experiment raised more revenue because it raised prices, um, or it, it, it raised prices in the auto insurance category, that, was, that, would, that would actually give you a very different interpretation of what the long-term impact would be than if the experiment raised revenue because it made users happier or um, did a better job matching ads to users. And so really understanding sort of how and why the algorithm worked would, was, I felt was very important. 
But of course, if you, once you start chopping up the data and analyzing the experiments ex post, you worry about invalidating your confidence intervals and kind of creating all sorts of havoc on your A-B testing platform. And so one of the things that I think is really exciting is, is as we collectively started developing tools, where you can have the best of both worlds. You can do postdoc analysis of your, of your experimental data without, uh, without invalidating confidence intervals and, with, and still being able to use them. Now, one of the things I've given a lot of talks about all the limitations and problems with, with A-B testing. Actually, there's a whole talk about it on, the, on this uh, conference about you know, doing experiments in marketplaces. Well, when you do experiments in marketplaces, lots of things go wrong because you know, short term is not equal to long term. Because you know, if, you, if an advertiser, um, something happens to them, they start running out of budget, that affects other advertisers. Like All of the problems that you think of with, with doing short term experiments come up in marketplaces. So I thought a lot about this as well. Um, one, one thing that you often want to do if you're in an environment, in a marketplace environment, um, or even an environment where you, know, you, you want to uh, think about making bigger changes that might take users a while to get used to, um, is you might want to do longer term experiments. Um, and so in that type of a world, you're not necessarily just going to be doing a simple, straightforward analysis. Like if I have a set of advertisers and they're treated and another set of advertisers that are control and I wanted to watch them over six months, I'm going to be needing to do more modeling in the background, be thinking about the time trends. I might want to be smoothing in certain ways. And so I want to think about in this, in this, my most recent work, how to um, expand some of the ideas that I've been trying to use in, in treatment effect heterogeneity in the simple cases to more complicated models. And as I said, there's actually been a, very, a big explosion of literature recently. I'm not going to be able to talk about it all. Um, I, I, co-authors have work on trees and forests. Um, some folks have been working on lasso. There's um, targeted ML. There's all sorts of... Uh, all sorts of different approaches, um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, approaches based on, on forests. So what do you need to do um, to make this theory work? Well, you know, generally, like machine learning methods are ideal for trying to understand heterogeneity and personalization. Um, but a lot of times, they don't have established statistical properties. And so part of my research agenda has been to figure out which uh, machine learning methods are very amenable to combining a world where you actually want statistical properties of your estimators. Why do you need statistical properties? Well, I mean, this audience is all very convinced that causal inference is important. Um, unlike prediction, the ground truth for causal inference is not directly observed. And if I'm trying to do a personalized estimate, well, even if I run an experiment, I still don't actually know the ground truth for you. Um, and so, you know, if I, if I need to, I can estimate it with an, a close neighborhood around you, but my estimate might depend on how I formed my neighborhood and what my other parts of my estimation are. So I'm actually, like, for a personalized treatment effect, I'm actually really never going to have a ground truth. And so I really do need statistical theory um, to help me understand whether my things are accurate. I also want to highlight in this sort of um, overview remarks that there are actually lots and lots of different questions you could be interested in. The subject of treatment effect heterogeneity or, or generally estimate heterogeneity is not confined to one question. So just myself, I've done some work on finding subgroups, like let's find a subpopulation that has high treatment effects. And I've also worked on personalized estimates, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So an individualized estimate just for you. Um, fully non-parametric. Other authors, like there's a recent paper by John List and co-authors that have said, I, what if I get an experiment? I want to test for every covariate whether there's heterogeneity in that covariate. So I just want to loop through all my covariates and look for all the heterogeneity. That's also an interesting scientific question. We might also want to look for robustness along different dimensions and, and see if and heterogeneity and robustness might be related. So there's lots of interesting questions here. There's not just one. Um, and they're useful for different purposes. So my most recent work is trying to extend a lot of these applications to more complex models. Um, for example, if you, if you needed to do instrumental variables uh, analysis, so in a lot of advertising experiments, you can't actually fully control who's treated. And so an instrumental variables approach is the right way to analyze the data, even if you actually tried to randomize uh, the assignment of the ads. Um, panel regression or other types of dynamic models might be important if you're watching people over time. If you're trying to do ad attribution and understand you know, how do different ads contribute to a final sale, um, you're going to need some sort of modeling um, on top of your experiment, even if you're randomizing along the way. So 
Um, what I'm going to do is try to show you how uh, some, some new tools we have to be able to extend the idea of doing treatment effect heterogeneity using machine learning methods to more complex models that are commonly used in the social sciences. So just a little notation, so we think about the potential outcomes framework, there are X's, those are the covariates, those are the things I observe about a person. Um, there's a response Y, that's your outcome. Um, I'll start out with a binary treatment assignment, like treated to control A, B, but we'll ex that, that's gonna dro that'll drop away as I, as I generalize. And so if you're in, the, in the simple um, A, B testing framework with a, with a, uh, where we would be looking for a conditional average treatment effect. So that means the, the expectation of the treatment effect for you given your X's. So that's what I'm mostly going to talk about today. Um, the starting point from my previous work was to try to analyze that in an environment of unconfoundedness, um, for example, a randomized experiment. So if you want to do uh, personalized estimates with uh, statistical properties, one nice place to start would be a, a k-nearest neighbors matching algorithm. Uh, also, a, a kernel would be another type of, um, of, of estimator. And essentially, so if I want to est make an estimate for Eric, I'm going to find people who are, who are just like Eric. You know, they've written awesome books, and they're public intellectuals, and they organize great conferences. And I'll find the treated guys just like Eric, and I'll find the control guys just like Eric, and I'll take the difference. And the, the awesome thing about that is then that's a, that, that estimator has great statistical properties. It's asymptotically normal and so on. But it's, it actually just doesn't work very well when you have a lot of covariates because it's hard to be nearby Eric on, on so many dimensions. And then you end up not nearby him on anything at all. So the, the idea that we're exploring in this series of papers is to try to um, adjust those types of methods that did have established statistical properties and combine them with machine learning methods that actually have been shown to perform very, very well in practice. So random forests are a popular heuristic. They have an excellent track record. If you want to win a contest with five minutes of work, it's probably your best bet. If you want to be in the top 5% of a machine learning prediction contest, they kind of work really well out of the box. Um, but, but there actually hasn't been a lot of, of theory until relatively recently about why random forests work and why they work so well. Um, and very recently, uh, with Stefan Wager, who's going to be a junior faculty at Stanford, he was a, a stats PhD from Stanford, now he's joined the business school, which is awesome for us. Um, we proved the first formal results about random forests for asymptotically valid inference. And so the basic idea of the random forest is that the, the theory is going to look a lot like the, the nearest neighbor theory, but it, we're just going to do kind of a smarter job of coming up with the neighborhoods. So K and N is going to just make, try to be nearby in every dimension, and you have to maybe decide ahead of time what the di important dimensions are. The random forest is going to go through the data and try to figure out what dimensions are important for putting you in the same neighborhood. And it's going to use this greedy heuristic, which just happens to work well in practice. So in another paper that just came out in PNS, we introduced this idea of a causal tree. And we said, well, beyond just the fact that you're going to be adaptive, you want to be adaptive to the thing you care about. If the thing you care about is treatment effect heterogeneity, then you should split according to treatment effect heterogeneity. The second thing we advocate is using something called sample splitting, where you build the tree on one part of the data and then re-estimate on another part of the data. And so that basically is going to give us valid confidence intervals and get rid of the biases, which are otherwise always going to be present in a classic application of an of a, of a adaptive algorithm. Adaptive meaning is that you peek at the data both to, to build your model as well as to do your estimates. And although in some conditions and some limits, as n goes to infinity, that can all work out, my personal experience with all the simulations I've run and the, across all sorts of models is you never really want to do that. Um, you don't really want to use a machine learning method to model, to model your data and then use that same data set to do your estimates. That's never, that's never a great idea. Um, so random forests work by building a bunch of trees and then averaging them up. Um, and you average up by subsampling. And so it turns out there's a beautiful statistical theory for subsampling with trees. And it basically, you're going to get the average of a lot of models. And, and that subsampling is going to give you asymptotic normality, even though any single tree will not. Um, so, so we have a theorem that says that if you use a random forest for predict prediction or for causal effects 
or we have something else we call a propensity forest where you split on the propensity score and then estimate, you end up getting asymptotically normal predictions. But it's very important that you use our modification, which is to use a split sample. So when you build the forest, you, you make different forests by subsampling. We want you to use two subsamples, one to build the tree and a second one to re-estimate. And just to kind of get a sense of how important that is, um, we have a, on the right here is a picture of the forest um, it's basically, this is, this is actually for an edge case, this is kind of extreme. As the number of observations increases, our honest forest that does the split sampling has no bias and the mean squared error falls, that's the blue. The adaptive forest, which uses the same data to both estimate and build the trees, actually has an increasing bias and increasing mean squared error with the sample size. And that's because with the bigger sample size, it actually more effectively um, kind of biases itself. That's kind of extreme, and that's, that's on the edge, but actually the, we generally are going to dominate for both bias and variance. While if you just do a single tree and you split sample, you're kind of throwing away half your data. So on the left, we show that the mean, if you just do a single tree and do sample splitting, the mean squared error is worse from sample splitting, but you get terrible coverage if you don't. You're, 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 you have all this bias, whereas if you do sample splitting, you get perfect coverage. So I think in the world where you're worried about um, using, you know, exploring the data and kind of screwing up your confidence intervals, sample splitting is kind of an awesome approach. And the cool thing is if you're building an ensemble of split sample models, you don't even lose anything, um, in, especially in the case of forests. So our newest work then takes this, this kind of whole approach to GMM models. And so any model that can be written as a generalized method of moment models or maximum likelihood model can be put into our framework. And so essentially what we want to do is, is look for parameter heterogeneity in, in, in a very big class of models. And so in order to do that, we're going to build on an existing stats literature that essentially tried to do like local GMM. And so the most popular one in economics is local linear regression. And it's basically a, a regression where you just weight nearby people more closely. And it's used fairly commonly in some parts of econometrics. But the problem with it is it screws up as soon as you have lots of covariates. So what we're going to do is just like we did in the previous work where we use the data to figure out what the neighborhood should be, we're going to use a random forest to figure out what the neighborhood should be for this local linear regression. Um, it, but we're going to do it a little bit differently because I think partly when I started this research, I envisioned that I was going to build trees and then estimate models within a leaf. But anybody who's ever estimated an instrumental variables regression or like a big complicated model, you don't want to keep splitting up your data more finely and finely and estimating complicated models in small subsamples. It's going to do terribly in practice. And our theory actually requires that we have small leaves. So it seemed like the, I was kind of stuck on this for a while. And then we had this insight that we actually shouldn't, you, do, we shouldn't do that. We should do something similar but different. And so what we end up doing is instead of estimating models within a leaf, we just use this, the structure of the forest to figure out what the weight should be. So we're going to use a splitting rule that's customized to your GMN objective. But then I'm just going to, I'm going to go back at the end and sort of estimate one big model using all the data. And I'm just going to weight people more closely who are in the same leaf as me more often. Um, and so what we're going to do with this then is we're going to derive splitting rules optimized for the objective. Of, of the GMM, so we're going to get heterogeneity in the right stuff. We're going to ignore nuisance parameters like fixed effects and so on. When we split, we're going to split based on our parameter of interest. And then we're going to be able to do, we're going to reestimate our model, but we're just going to weight every observation for people that are nearby you in the dimensions that are relevant for the, for the heterogeneity for you. And so it turns out that the asymptotic theory for this is actually harder, and we had to do more tricks. Um, but in the end, we got it to all work out. And if you do our, our method, it's going to be asymptotically normal. So uh, just to, I can, I'll just show you a picture of, uh, of how we applied this to an instrumental variables uh, application. This is the Angrist uh, uh, application of the effect of family size on women's labor force participation. And it's an instrumental variables application. And so what we can show is what the, what the um, estimated treatment effect is, say, as a function of father's income and as a function of mother's age at first birth. And what you find is that, say, like if the father's income is in the you know, 40 to 60 range, we're going to get higher estimates. And when we, of course, they have different baseline uh, levels of participation. So when you normalize by their baseline levels of participation, you kind of see this middle, this middle range here as being a very high treatment effect range. 
Um, and so, but so more broadly, if you have whatever your model is, at some point I thought I was going to have to go out and code up like you know 50 different models. I'm going to have the IV version and the panel version, and each of them was going to require tweaking. What we do in this paper um, is we actually just have one set of code, and you give me the moments, and I'm going to be able to apply them, have a computationally um, uh, a nice approach that we use something that's analogous to gradient boosting. And, uh, and get these heterogeneous estimates. So I hope this is going to help people be able to apply these techniques in, in the context of natural experiments as well as more complicated uh, designed experiments. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Steve. Our next speaker is Catherine. If you can come on up. And while she's setting up, let me just ask a question, Susan. Uh, so you've been doing a lot of the cutting edge theoretical work. You've also have been fortunate to get some great data sets to work with. Say a little bit about how that has, how you've learned from the two sets. In particular, you had a lot of asymptotic results there, but with high dimensions, may they may or may not hold. Have you have you learned where and when the theory holds and doesn't from that data you're working with? Yes. Yeah, so there is a little bit of schizophrenia. So um, if you if I wanted to build something in an A/B testing platform and I really want like all of my standard errors to be right. It's, I think it's really hard to get fully personalized estimates with perfect coverage that you can always rely on. Like these, these, these asymptotic results are right, but we show clearly in our simulations that the coverage is going to start to yeah. fall off. And any time you want to do personalization, you're going to have bias. So I still feel like actually the subgroup analysis is what I would recommend in practice because when you have subgroups, I, I can basically, my, my objective function is going to make the subgroups big enough that I'm going to get statistically reliable results. And then if I do sample splitting, I'm going to have perfect coverage and no bias. Right. So that's going to be the best thing to do from that perspective. The, um, but I think people often really want full personalization. Mm -hmm. um, so, for, but, so, so I think the, the statistical results are going to guide you. And in fact, they guide you well, because it turns out the random forest can really screw you up if you just let it go do what it's supposed to do when it's programmed into R. So it really helped us, guide us to something that works. But I still don't think that anybody could ever promise you perfect coverage if you have a data set of a million users and you know, 2,000 covariates. That's, not gonna, that's actually not enough to get, to get sort of all the asymptotics to kick in. Great. So I think the confidence intervals are helpful, but they're not perfect. OK, thanks. And now we'll hear from Catherine, I think a paper that's never been presented before. No, that's exactly right. Oh, wonderful, I'm amplified. So yes, so no, we're so excited to be here because we're presenting some very, very new results from the digital currency experiment. And you're seeing right, Susan's all over this as well. Um, but also I want to introduce Christian, who's sitting right here, who's also with me at MIT. Now, what we're going to be doing today is a slightly unusual topic in experimentation. In that if you think about it, basically privacy concerns often haunt a lot of what we do. But we're going to be turning the tables in some sense and using experimentation to try and understand privacy concerns. And in particular, we're going to be investigating something I call the privacy paradox, and it's been called before. Um, and basically, the privacy paradox describes this idea that everyone talks a lot about privacy and how worried they are about privacy, but then we look out there and people do a lot of things that don't seem consistent with that. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be investigating uh, various forms of this paradox, which is why is it that people say they care so much about their privacy and then share their data so readily with commercial firms? Why is it there's all these wonderful privacy protective technologies out there, but people aren't using them? And why is it that people say they care so much about government surveillance but continue to act on the internet like no one was watching? Now, at this point, I also have to admit to a little bit of false marketing. I know we had all over the title the uh, MIT Digital Currency Experiment. And that's certainly going to be the application where we're going to get all the insights. But I do want to tell you it's not about the currency experiment per se. Uh, we can always go onto Bitcoin if we want to talk about it, but think of this as a set of field experiments about privacy. So let's talk a little bit about the experiment that we're going to be using. And this was an experiment done at MIT, and it was an amazing thing to be involved with, in that basically our wonderful group of undergraduates, the MIT Bitcoin Club, managed to somehow raise an enormous amount of money 
from some very rich MIT alumni. I bet my dean just wishes he could do it. Got millions of dollars and were able to give and had this vision that they were going to give $100 in Bitcoin to every MIT undergraduate. So that's the background of the study. And what we're going to be actually looking at is how these students behaved in terms of protecting their privacy when thinking about what data to share as part of the experiment and also how they were going to protect their privacy when using Bitcoin. Now, we're going to have um, a subject pool of 4,500 undergraduates. 70% of them ended up being part of the, uh, the study. And what basically they had to do is to get their $100 in Bitcoin. They had to choose a wallet in which to put the Bitcoin. Think of this as the technology here. And during this process, they were subject to various randomizations. And this is what we're going to study. The first randomization is going to be a reward of giving them pizza for their data. Uh, another randomization is going to be how the order of the wallets in which they appeared on the website. There's going to be randomization about whether we prompted them about using encryption. And there's also going to be randomization about how much information we gave them about privacy. So let's see how this all fell out, all fell out. And we're going to start off with distortions, which call, uh, a result of what I'm going to call, in some sense, small money or small incentives. Now, what we actually did as part of the study was we asked our students for emails of their friends. And I must admit, we didn't do this to study privacy. We just asked them because we were interested in their social networks because we wanted to see how Bitcoin spread. And what we hadn't realized when we asked for this information is actually the emails or contact details of your friends is one of the most private things you can ever ask people. And so this is a survey done by one of these people who study privacy. And what they show is that basically we acted in a way which is nearly as bad is asking them for their social security number. This is one of the pieces of information online that you feel very reluctant to actually share. Now, so that's, so we basically think of this as a dependent variable. We've asked you for a very private piece of information to do with your friends. Now, the randomization is going to be that we gave half of the MIT students pizza. Uh, that is the, uh, the randomization, and we said, you know, if you, give us, if, we, if you give us the email, then you and your friends will be able to share this happy pizza together. And this is how it affected behavior. Now, the y-axis here is how many times that student gave us false information in terms of making up emails that didn't exist. We know all the emails, so we know whether or not they're telling the truth, and we wanted to see whether they falsified data to escape our, you know, this kind of surveillance. Now, you might be saying, okay, but maybe this could be just that people uh, unintentionally make spelling mistakes, this kind of thing. Let's be clear, this was intentional suppression of data. We can tell that by the number of swear words they included <laughs> in the email addresses. You know, I know Eric said it was informal. I don't think we're that quite that informal. But let's be clear, they express clearly the opinions of researchers who asked for this information. So, OK. Now, so what we have is you can see that when we um, gave this pizza incentive, we managed to cut down, in some sense, the amount of false data or intentional escaping for surveillance by about two thirds. So it was quite a profound effect. Um, now, I feel terrible because Susan's been busy telling us all about the importance of heterogeneity of treatment effects. And the trouble we have with this one is that we have not yet found any heterogeneity. Um, in that, it seems that this pizza experiment or pizza prompt encouraged everyone just about to uh, be more less privacy protective. What I have here is a split by whether or not you live in a privacy-sensitive dorm. My idea, the idea here is if you're in a privacy-sensitive context, you're going to be particularly not, not eager to give up your friend's emails. 
And you can see here that without the pizza prompt, people do act consistently with their context, right? They do not, uh, they do try and escape surveillance uh, to a higher degree. However, as soon as we give this pizza incentive is the moment we make even as these privacy conscious folks uh, uh, give up their data. All right, so that's the first randomization. Let's now talk about another randomization. And this was a randomization where we simply changed the order in which the technologies the students could use appeared on the page. We had four wallets that they could choose between. And we simply randomized how they appeared on the page and which was first. Now, there have been, since we did the study, quite a few surveys of how privacy protective different wallets are, and in particular, how much they uh, protect you from risks of being observed by the government or potentially other people on the blockchain. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use these sort of outside opinions to classify these wallets into how privacy protective they are. And then we're going to see how their position on the page affected whether or not people chose them. And so what you can see here, this is the number of people who chose, or the proportion of people who chose a wallet which were protective of people's privacy. And you can see there that the moment we put a wallet uh, which is less privacy protective, just at the top, is the moment we see individuals stop using, to a certain extent, the, uh, the privacy protective technology. Now, you might look at this and say, well, is that a big effect? So it's about like 10%. But think, 10% and all we've done is change slightly the position on the page, right? For me, given how you know, much work that's been in privacy protective technologies in this space, the fact that a small change or flip in page position then can occur in effect, what people choose seems quite immense. Now, you know what? Again, I'm sorry, Susan. Again, we tried so hard, but we have not found much heterogeneity in these treatment effects in that we have this, what you ever think of it, search cost effect occur for both um, for both people who say they care about privacy and people who don't, right? It seems to be uniform. Now, the final thing that we looked at was um, whether or not we could distract people in some sense by offering them what I think of as a shiny, new, but orthogonal technology to stop thinking about protecting their privacy. And this is a little bit more complex as an experiment uh, in that we're going to use two randomizations here. And what we used was, first of all, sometimes for half our subjects, we gave them a lot of information about privacy of these wallets. And much of this was focused, actually, on escaping government surveillance. We also get, had an orthogonal randomization where we randomized whether or not we prompted people to use PGP, which is an encryption technology. Now, what I want to highlight is that if you're using encryption technology to transmit your information to us, it really doesn't affect much about then your subsequent wallet use. But this is how we're going to see it play out. So here on the y-axis, what we have is whether or not that student then took the step of linking their wallet to a bank account. Now, why is this meaningful in a privacy sense? Well, one of the promises of Bitcoin is that you can escape surveillance from the government. But the moment you link your Bitcoin wallet to an existing bank account is the moment you're back in the world of government surveillance through the traditional banking sector. So that's going to be our measure of privacy here. And what you can see here is I've split it up by these two randomizations. And so we have here uh, on the left-hand side um, just where you don't receive any information about the wallets, and then on the right-hand side where you get all this privacy information. 
And then we also split it up further by this encryption randomization. And what you should see there is that in general, um, when we give this privacy information, we can actually uh, make people think more carefully, do I want to link my wallet to uh, a, a way of being tracked by the government? But if I've given them also the option of using a completely orthogonal privacy protective technology, then which isn't going to protect you from any surveillance from the government, we can actually distract them into not behaving in a particularly privacy protective way. So let's conclude. Of course, there are limitations that there are with any experiment. Uh, limitations. So it's very MIT, right? Um, I actually think that's a good thing. You might say, well, what does that mean, MIT? Um, so it means that we're dealing with, I would say, quite a savvy, tech-savvy, sophisticated population. And given that a lot of arguments about the privacy paradox are just simply that people don't understand what's going on, I'd actually say as a late, that makes it quite interesting. Um, the other limitation, which I'll say in general, is that we haven't tried to put any policy interpretations on these results. I've talked to people about them, and there are two ways of thinking about it. First of all, you could say, oh, uh, if you take a more laissez-faire approach, say, OK, you have evidence that people really don't care about their privacy. Small things can easily distract them. Uh, it shows that we should focus on revealed preference, and not stated preference. I think another viewpoint, which may be just as valid, is to say, oh my gosh, you've actually got evidence that potentially people do not know how to behave in a privacy protective way in the face of very small incentives. Perhaps that is something where you might, might justify intervention. So let's just summarize. We document this privacy paradox, different dimensions of the privacy paradox using field experiment data. We show that, in general, people say they care about the privacy, but if you offer them something as small as a slice of cheese pizza, they may start to give up some very sensitive data. Similarly, they, there's a lot of privacy, privacy protective technologies out there, but incredibly small costs, such as where it appears in the page, can actually affect people's usage of them. And finally, people worry about government surveillance, but they're happy to stop worrying about it if it's the case that you give them some kind of orthogonal reassurance, which really, if you think about it, isn't that reassuring. So with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you. That was terrific. But now we get an even more fun part, where all of you uh, are going to get a chance to ask some questions. So we're looking forward to some really interesting questions. Susan, why don't you come on up? Catherine, okay. have a seat. Um, and while you guys formulate an interesting question, let me uh, get the ball rolling. And actually, let, let me do a, a, a little poll. I think one of the interesting innovations that the undergrads uh, taught us was that you can raise grant money for the purpose of giving money to yourself. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's a really uh, good innovation we should think about. And so we're, I, I was thinking we, maybe we should, Sandy and Sina, we could uh, ask some of the sponsors to give money to all the participants here. <laughs> um, but to make it an experiment, in this case an analog experiment, let me, let me propose two ways. You guys can tell, help us decide which way to do it. If we gave you all a $10 gift card, which you get to use, anonymous, no information. Or we could all give you a $12 gift card, <laughs> But the sponsor would get to know what you were spending. So those are your choices. Think about which one you'd want. How many people here would prefer to have the $10 gift card? Well, and how many people would prefer to have the $12 gift card? OK. That's actually about half and half. So that's a, this is an audience perhaps prompted by uh, Catherine's. It's a little more privacy concerned. Uh, maybe if I threw in a pizza, that might make the difference. Um, the, that experiment has been done in, in malls and shopping malls and elsewhere. And the vast majority of people choose the $12 gift card. This is not a, a typical audience. Maybe I should have made the numbers a little higher for you guys. <laughs> um, but it does show that the, the, this privacy paradox that, that Catherine was talking about. Um, so are there any questions that you guys would like to ask the uh, Catherine and Susan? Yes. What's a privacy sensitive dorm? Oh. That's a nice question. So basically, we asked people in a survey, so this is a preference, about how worried they were about uh, degrees of government surveillance. 
And then we actually had data on what dorm they lived uh, in. And then we just took, I think a privacy sensitive dorm is just whether you're in an above medium privacy sensitive context by that measure. If you want to speak MIT, a lot of them are in East Campus. Sandy? Uh, by the way, this is Sandy Kaplan, in case you guys don't already know me. I sort of have two questions. One is, is for certain uh, So one of the things I've been concerned about recently is, is uh, alpha-stable distributions, where you have these long tails, where it's very difficult to get a representative sample of anything. Mm -hmm. And for badly unstable things, the mean isn't defined, the variance certainly isn't defined. Uh, and, and one of the things that, that, I mean, that sort of also goes over to the privacy thing. So we were involved in a large study, worldwide study. And one of the biggest things in privacy was is that there's a large fraction of people that, are particularly tech savvy people, just think you're screwed anyhow. And so anything you do doesn't really matter because you're involved in MIT. But, but that goes back to the first one because there's this amazing heterogeneity in terms of the complexity of how people think about privacy. So maybe maybe that actually does something with the two of you. Maybe I'll let you discuss with one person. I'll come back to the boring technical thing. Well, oh, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> you know, Sandy, we have searched for a long time for lots more heterogeneity in the results than we currently have. Especially the pizza randomization, I have been shocked that I have not been able to kill it. Because I always feel that when you kill an effect is when you really understand it. And I haven't been able to kill it. Even amongst this immensely, you know, I can take the top coders of MIT who have released an app. Take any profile you like, I'm still seeing this effect. So if you have ideas about how to kill some of my effects, I would love them. One of the things which has slightly daunted me, daunted me studying this, is that these effects seem so strong across so many populations. Yeah, so um, maybe actually before I jump into that, I'll also respond to something Eric said at the beginning about giving the money. So just as a background to this experiment, um, really I think the reason that the students wanted to do this and the reason the donors gave the money was that they had the idea that they were going to seed Bitcoin usage at MIT. And so a lot of the donors were people who were also investors in the Bitcoin community, investors in Bitcoin firms, venture capitalists, things like that. So actually the whole idea of this experiment was to get people to use Bitcoin. And then we kind of hijacked the, the opportunity to learn about other things with randomization. This is an increasingly common model in uh, Silicon Valley is to give users money to get them to use the product in one way or another. Exactly, exactly. And so the idea was there were all these sort of network effects in this very sophisticated population. And so you know, what's interesting about this very sophisticated population and also what's interesting about Bitcoin uh, and, and sort of how you were that the, the idea was that this, this intersection between privacy, surveillance, everything else sort of is, is a fundamental feature of the product. And also this was an interesting population for it. Um, for, the, for the long tails thing, actually, there's, I think there's actually some pretty deep and important technical issues there. Um, and actually my earlier answer to Eric, there, it, it is hard when you're doing in some sense, like getting a personalized estimate is an impossible task um, statistically. Um, it, you know, I said there's no ground truth, but also in some sense, it's it's kind of impossible to really get perfect coverage, perfect unbiasedness, perfect confidence intervals everywhere. When you do, when we do the simulations, um, even in sort of a modest sized data set, you do kind of well in the middle of your distribution, and around the boundaries, you just do really badly. Um, now, there are ways you can correct it, and, you, and, and actually in, in the historical non-parametric econometrics literature, you did stuff like trimming, so that you just said, hey, there's part of this where I just can't know the answer, and you try to kind of use the data to tell you where you can and can't answer your question, and you answer a more limited question. So I think that um, roughly, you know, in like if, if you have these kind of fat tails problems, it, it'll be a good future research thing would be to do a better job for us developing heuristics for where you know that you don't know. Um, and actually, that br more broadly, this has been a huge controversy in econometrics, like going back like a couple of decades and people really 
um, being very uh, assertive about like what a bad person you are if you if you admit that you don't know everything and you're going to focus on something that you can measure but but maybe isn't the thing you were interested in like a local average treatment effect is basically like the effect of the people that were influenced by your natural experiment. Um, you know, some people have said, well, that's what you can learn about in your data, so let's study that thing, even though it's not what I was originally interested in. Other people have said, like, that's a waste of time and you should just keep making assumptions or until you can, until you can estimate the thing you really care about. So my view is to generally, my personal preference is to try to be very honest about what you know and you don't know and, you know, and, and try to focus in on it. And I think that's a great research direction. These fat tails are just everywhere in online data, um, and so that's absolutely a great topic. Some years ago, uh, Scott McNeely famously said, uh, you know, the quote, um, in a digital world, you have zero privacy, get over it. Um, and in light of your, the answer you just gave to Sandy's question, you, you know, how true is that? Is, is, it, is it, are we reaching a world where um, people can make inferences about everything that you do uh, once you're online, or uh, is it, is that not an accurate view of the world? You're the privacy subject matter expert, okay. Catherine. <laughs> OK. Um, so if I was to sort of like step back in terms of the more nuance we have in the mm -hmm. study, I think one of the important points we make is that ultimately you can have privacy. We can think of privacy. You know, you say you have no privacy. You can make choices about who you protect your privacy from. And you have choices about whether you protect your privacy from the government, from the public in the form of Bitcoin and the, the blockchain, or potentially from commercial firms. And what we also witness to a certain extent in the data is the extent to which we see MIT students trading those off. Mm -hmm. In that there's often a lot more concern, say, about escaping government surveillance but perhaps also that the company is a trust in terms of entrusting my data towards these smaller startups where to me it's not so clear you know, exactly how much more secure that data is. So I think the answer is that it's not the case you can't have privacy, but you're going to make trade-offs about who you're going to tr trust to safeguard that data. Well, just to push a little harder on that, I mean, how has it changed in the past decade or two in terms of what companies and government can learn about you uh, because of the fact that so much of what we do is now digital. There's, a, there's a, a cloud of digital data we generate every time we walk around. We all have our cell phones in our pockets right now. And uh, there's a lot of inferences that potentially we're broadcasting um, that people can pick up fairly easily. Yeah, and maybe I'll comment on a few angles on that. So. I do think it has changed an enormous amount. Like mm -hmm. I remember the first time I saw like web browsing data or search data, mm -hmm. and it was just like whoa. And and you really did until you actually like read a, a session. You know, you don't really think about how um, invasive it is. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's people you know doing seven word porn search terms or um, you know which are really alarming. That's, that's a long search. It, <laughs> it is. It is. And there's a lot of them. Um, it's, but you know or you know, just the fact that when you really see like what people do even over the course of the hour, like you really feel like you know the person. Um, and, and, and you don't think about it yourself because you think about each thing you're going to more in isolation. But if you just read one, if you even look back at your own history and just like you can do it on Google history and you realize like how informative it is. And, and you know, you can still see on Google history how many searches I did on, you know, in, in spring of 2006 on a particular date. You know that was that was like kind of already broadly informative, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I do think the cell phone just takes it to another level. So I'm just I'm getting started looking at a data set um, of mobile, and so you know when you leave your apps running in the background, they are pinging, and app developers um, sell that data. So like right now, you know if you're a digital marketer, you can I can put an ad on you, and then I can basically pay for the service that somebody's going to ping me if you walk into a car dealership in the next month. Mm -hmm. And so how do they know that about you? Well, it's one of those apps you have running in the background is selling that data into an exchange. So, you know, you, you sort of, I, I think even a few months ago, I sort of thought, well, maybe this is happening at a low level and I just hadn't been paying attention. And no, no, like this is sort of systematically available. 
And if I get a data set that, say, has like millions, tens of millions of Americans, you know, 100 times a day, like I can now, I can figure out where you live and where you work and, you know, where you go to the bar. And it's going to be awesome for social science research. Um, but, you know, this is like, I think, another level of, um, of invasion. And, and also, if you think about like, you know, if you were texting in the car, like, you know, you could get sued. The, 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 I think the things that can go wrong with some of these types of data are sort of much, much, there's many more things that you might be doing wrong or might not want someone to know that are measurable than they were when I just saw you browsing the internet. Like, if you weren't searching for guns, you know, if you weren't doing seven word point searches, like, it might not have been that embarrassing for you, but now kind of knowing everywhere you go, I think, is another level deep. And then in terms of like, well, do we really just punt and give up? Well, like, you know, it, it actually is a lot of work now. Like, you, you gotta go, go home and, and go through your phone. But, like, I don't actually know if I'm going into these data sets myself. Like, because I don't know exactly which of the apps are selling the data. And, you know, some of them just don't work. Like, if Pokemon Go was selling the data <coughs> when my kids were in that thing, like, they never wanted to turn it off. So, you know, you, you, so catching a little Pokemon is gonna basically let people track you all over the world. So I, I think mm -hmm. it, is, it is actually a really big issue, and, and in some sense, we're not gonna solve it until we actually like, do something more with the data itself, like encrypting it, not keeping it, um, you know, something more fundamental, because the digital exhaust is, is sort of so, is so pervasive, so great, so many different people watching you, that it, it has actually become pretty hard to escape. Well, this is a, this is a really key question, though. Um, you say someday we may be able to have some mechanism. We can get into that. What about today? If somebody wanted to opt out right now, short of going to Maine and going off the grid, um, is, do you see that as, as feasible? Or, or do, do we have too many ways of tracking people that it's just not, not practical? In other words, coming back to Scott McNeely's question. <laughs> So, I mean, I must admit, having entered in and got a taste for this Bitcoin community, I'm amazed about how much investment and passion there is in the tech, tech community about trying to help people to achieve your, you know, your, the sort of stated aim of, of, of privacy protectiveness. Um, so maybe I'm not quite on the, uh, the side of uh, thinking that we're... Um, Are you disagreeing with your co-author here? Actually, even on Bitcoin, though, I mean, I have another oh, paper gosh. where I, where I yeah. you know, basically classify people. I can figure out what country you live in by what time zone you're using the blockchain. You can actually find all the, the MIT, you know, I tried to find all the MIT students before, we, you know, without merging the data, and I found almost all of them perfectly, and, you know, you can, you can see. Right. There have been studies looking at, at Facebook behavior that you can make inferences about their gender orientation, their political beliefs, their drug use, their, their parents. Yeah, family. I mean, Bitcoin in particular, though, I mean, is, is, is actually pretty, in its first incarnations, was pretty ineffective um, because it's all public. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. that's the point. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you want to track down any particular person, you know, it's, it's not so hard. They have these mixing services, but people are doing small transactions. So if you throw, you, you can basically, mm -hmm. like, throw in $10,000 with a whole bunch of other people putting in a dollar each, right. then, yeah. you know, 10000 thousand goes in, ten thousand goes out, it's a new address. But I, I, I mean I know who you are yeah. still because you, you would have to mix up with other people who had ten thousand dollars to do that. Now there are brand new actually coins that are coming out now that are truly designed to protect your privacy mm -hmm. and people may go there. There's a bigger issue actually if this is something just to think about, it's a little more off topic, but um, one of the things the Bank of England is looking at is um, planning for the future national digital currency. I think that's obviously something we are all going to have to think about. Of course, we're going to get rid of cash. If we get rid of cash, we would have some kind of national blockchain. Why do we have to get rid of cash? Because we're going to get rid of cash. Who wants cash? It's a pain in the ass. Some people, um, <laughs> some, some people want it for, for exactly this reason. Well, so, so I think the point, so when you start taking this through to its logical conclusion, so there'd be lots of reasons to get rid of cash. You'd get rid of tax evasion. You would get rid of a lot of illegal behavior. For the government, behavior. but then the people who want to have you would, anonymous yeah, transactions. And you, you, could give, um, you could give every citizen basically a bank account with the central bank for free. You would have free payments. 
um, instant payments. So ultimately, we're going to go to something like that. But then I think the, your point, which is my point as well, is that in a world where everything, the, every financial transaction you make is on a government blockchain, there is going to be a huge demand for people to not have that. So if you get rid of cash, like my, you would either have a new cash, like pe even in some countries, yeah, I'm not pe sure Ron people Paul use laundry would sign detergent, up for that. Yeah. Um, and and or you know these these kind of alternative digital currencies mm -hmm. may actually be more needed when you don't have cash than when you do, because cash is actually actually incredibly anonymous. Right. Yeah. So, so we got several questions over there. Yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, the privacy experiment seems to be to, to me to be large scale confined to a small setting. And so I, I understand that you have a hard time to tease out heterogeneous effects, but perhaps you have a rich setting to understand interference. And the re I think interference is actually very interesting in this example because there's lots of learning about privacy and how my friends understand privacy actually impacts how I learn, how I think about privacy. So I'm just wondering if you ever thought about that, if you're going in that direction, because I think there's a crossover there that needs to be. The, this whole experiment was supposed to be like this awesome uh, network effects so experiment. Can you repeat that oh. question? Oh, the, the question was, um, was, isn't there a lot of interference and interaction among the people? And so the, the hope was that in addition to this awesome privacy paper, we were also going to have an awesome paper about the diffusion of the technology and behavior and network effects and everything else. And unfortunately, the students mostly didn't do very much with their Bitcoins. Um, and so the, uh, that there's, there's not too much we can say because they, like you, would, you might want to see like, you know, what they do later and like if they gamble, do they do, then do this and do they you know, go off blockchain? And so, so we, Catherine, you can say more, but unfortunately we were just really limited by the size of the experiment and the lack of activity of the students. Yeah. So I mean, I'm noticing we have some mics, by the way. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and, and sit on or Dave will get you the mic. Yes, yeah, so now I just want to pick up on two things. First of all, what was interesting, just picking up what's thought about mixing technologies, was that we did study whether or not our students were using them, and this is like a really sort of smart set of kids. And the numbers were disappointingly small, because we were actually hoping, you know, if you're thinking about a network effects model, that they could be perhaps learning about these techniques, and we just didn't have enough incidences to actually see people taking that privacy protective behavior. But in general, the you, reason we were you, so you, excited. You do have a paper of, a, a little bit about that, right? But, right? I think I saw a paper where you discuss a little bit of the, the effects. Uh, no, so this is the paper. So we have, a, we have another paper where we talk a little bit about the, uh, the, lack, of effects, house, yeah. well, the lack of effects. Yeah. But actually, I was just talking about the mixing technologies, which we can think of as the privacy protective choice. Mm -hmm. And that's part of this paper. We just didn't see any learning or transmission, but hey, perhaps it's just because no one was using them. All right, I think we have a question over here. Oh, okay, well, Mike over there, right there, okay, great. So we've talked a little bit about um, sort of big end studies, right? So we have all this exhaust and we have millions of observations and we can sort of run A-B tests and find these heterogeneous effects. Given the sort of, uh, sort of technology that you're developing, how do we think about power calculations and the minimum size we need, particularly as we're doing treatments that may have negative or potentially harmful outcomes? So if we look at sort of, you know, the medical literature, it's often, I mean, what's the smallest sample I can run where I get something that's interesting? And so I haven't, I, you know, would love to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So I think there's actually a few interesting directions there. So as I mentioned, there's a one part of this literature that's going towards um, kind of s multiple testing issues and kind of testing all effects. And there, one of the interesting insights, this isn't my insight from, but from the Liz Shake paper, is that if you think about like testing a bunch of different covariates, you actually have more power than you think you do. Because what's often the case, think about like a demographic database, you know, income and education and other covariates are actually all correlated with one another and they're all leading to the same kinds of effects. And so if you actually correct properly for the correlation among the tests, your multiple testing problem isn't always as big as you think it is. Um, of course, you're also not learning three different things when you find that there's heterogeneity with income and parents' education and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, one, one aspect of things is if you're trying to look for heterogeneity, you really have to think about the correlation. And that's also related to my work on finding subgroups because I'm going to use uh, trees to find a subgroup that has high effects. Uh, one thing people don't like about trees is that they're sort of unstable. But 
a lot of times the instability isn't actually that important because there may be like five different ways to find Eric. You know, he's like special because of his awesome book and his awesome conferences and anything else. But in the end of the day, I'm gonna, I might have a group with Eric and Sinan and, you know, I keep finding them different ways, but it's actually the same people. And so that's another version of the fact that you have kind of these correlated effects and so your power can be sort of greater than you think it is for a large number of covariates. I would say like the subgroup analysis that I do has this, this kind of, um, this is a PNS paper that just came out. It has this kind of nice feature that the splitting rule that we use is going to balance the, the bias and the, and the, and the variance of the, of the future estimator. And so it's going to actually sort of for you figure out how many groups you can get a good estimate for. And then the fact that we sample split means I don't have to do any multiple testing corrections. So it's it's uh, so I guess if you if you wanted to think about doing this ahead of time, you could do a simulated data set and just sort of run our tool, and it's going to roughly tell you, you know, in, in in this kind of simulation, how many groups do you think you're going to get, and if you or how much heterogeneity you're going to be able to find. So you know, in practice, if you have a thousand observations and a thousand covariates, we might only find you two groups. Mm -hmm. Or, or four groups. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's just what it is. That's how many, you need a certain number of observations to be able to, to test the hypothesis. Got it. Great, thanks. If you get more quick questions and comments, go ahead, over there. Okay, hi, I'm Katrina from uh, Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. Um, I'm really interested in this issue of giving away your friend's contact info. And so I was wondering, going back to sort of the details of the experiment, which reasons did you give for um, for asking for the friends, the students' uh, friends' information? Okay, so we randomized between giving no real reason, or just asking for it, and we randomized where where we gave them, where we told them, if you give us your friends' email addresses, you're going to be able to share this pizza. But you didn't give any purpose for it. You just said no, we no, want because it. because they would get the pizza, they so they could them. invite their friends to the pizza. So half of them. But would not a reason why you want. I mean, other no. than the, I mean, yeah. No, we never. We didn't no, explain like, our intentions. We just uh, in one condition well, we asked for the data, for? and the other one we just we gave them the, an incentive for them to use it. By the way, Eric's email is ericb at mit.edu. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just. Hi. <laughs> I'm Lior Zalmanson from New York University, and I'm so glad that you presented this because we have also results tomorrow on um, similar research on privacy paradox. So sorry, I apologize for the shameless self-promotion, but I wanted to ask if um, what we encountered, what we, what we showed there, is that call to actions in a content websites really affect subsequent information revelation very dramatically. And the mechanism uh, we attempt to show is that what changes is the level of trust. So even um, a seemingly unrelated call to action really changes the trust you have in the website. Uh, so I was wondering if you also measured trust-related variables, like could the, um, could the incentive itself, just the offering of a pizza, change the trust in that specific situation without changing the general privacy preference? So no, we didn't. So first, the answer to your question is no, we didn't ask any questions about trust. I mean, what I could, all I can say is that Christian has done an amazing job of going through all the free-form comments we received. And I think we're in a slightly unusual situation, probably unlike your study, in that this was an MIT study. The provost office was behind it. Um, so I don't know if we could have ever quite replicated that commercial context, right. but certainly it's a very interesting result. It's sort of a community where people, especially the provost behind it, that gets to the earlier question about why did you ask for the information, maybe they're sort of, well, if this is part of yeah. the MIT study, and you're not going to use it to sign me up for spam. Yeah. And so it's still amazing that even with that proud provost endorsement that we still got such a negative reaction right. from that question. Uh, question over here. Yeah, hi, uh, Neil Efron, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, last week, actually, Tom Khalil, Kale actually, at the Office of Science Technology Policy at the White House, got a bunch of uh, leaders in the educational technology space that are doing randomized control trials and platforms together, because we as a nation know we want to do this personalization thing for our kids. Lots of companies are advertising they do all this personalization already. I'm curious to know, um, 
Those are probably those claims are probably exaggerated. Um, how do we actually know? How do we actually turn your? And I guess this is for Susan. How do we turn your algorithm around to also maybe be able to know when we're not going to be getting personalization effects? Like, there's nothing really exciting about it. And I, as a guy that does this, I'm excited about it. But I also kind of recognize that there's probably a lot more hope than is real. Uh, will we be able to know when we're not succeeding? And let me just mention, by the way, Tom Clay wanted to be here, wasn't able to, but he did send a, uh, question, a set of questions. And if you haven't already picked them up, there's a stack of them out front. And we'll be talking some more at the fireside chat about those issues. But go ahead. Yeah, so I think what's, what's kind of interesting about all of this is the, um, there's really two sides of a very similar coin. One is kind of estimating policies, like finding what is the best policy, where, where is the heterogeneity, and the second is sort of evaluating policies. And actually, the, the kind of easier part is evaluating policies, so, and, and that's actually what, like say, a search engine would do, if this is a, a little bit complicated, but also interesting and sort of deep in a way, that like what a search engine would do historically is that they would come up with these very complicated ways to estimate personalized policies. And then they would run like A versus B on a set of users. So you're gonna have a million users get personalized policy A and a million users get personalized policy B. So the, 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 the kind of control scenario is already a personalized policy and now you're trying to beat it with another personalized policy. And in some sense, that's not a hard problem. I just need enough people. And then I can see, you know, I don't know why, I don't know how, you may have been really stupid when you came up with your personalized policy for all I know, but here the <laughs> B group does better than the A group. And so I can kind of in a somewhat mindless way, um, you know, I could just kind of keep trying stuff and I can eventually find personalized policies that work better from testing B versus A. Of course, they, are, they were very scientific and, and they did know what they were doing, but you don't have to if you want to just kind of very slowly over a period of years with billions of users kind of climb up a hill and get better. You can just keep testing things. And so then I think where the frontier of research is right now, in some sense where all this stuff comes in and starts to matter, is well, suppose that we want to do it really efficiently. Suppose we want to, you know, do it, estimate policies better. Maybe we want to use our data effectively. We don't want to subject a lot of students to bad policies. We want to sort of learn very quickly. Or, we, you know, for an individual student, we want their journey to be such that we're able to personalize for them very quickly. That's where the frontier of research is right now, and that's where a lot of this fits in. So it's not to say that they, they weren't doing it before, the, where the science is now is just let's do it better, faster, more efficiently, guided by theory in a smart way. And we're going to actually, there's a bunch of papers at this conference today that are going to talk about that from various perspectives. So we're down to the last couple of minutes. Let's have some real quick questions and quick answers. And go ahead. All right, I will make it, it's question very quick. My name is Shemin Nu from Temple University. So the privacy is really big on the mobile phone. As you, uh, Susan mentioned, that the mobile is going to be because really personally attached. So what are the algorithm you see on the mobile platform when they do targeting, personalization, that really uh, messed up this privacy issue from consumer side? So the second question is more related to Catherine. So when you talk about the privacy issues, firm may be exaggerating the industry, advertising industry also exaggerating, okay, I can promise some benefits, but do you see really like personalization, personal on what? On the demographic, on the behavior, or on the <laughs> interest of the social learning, these things, like what kind of practice the company is doing really benefit themselves <coughs> and the consumers? Go ahead. You want to go? Let me okay. first. Um, so I've got this old paper where I show that ultimately the two types of advertising, one which grabs your attention by being intrusive, I mean those pop-up ads that go all over your screen and you have to hit a monkey kind of ad, and the ads which are more subtle, textual, personalized. And both are equally effective, but one of the dangers we never talk about is when we ban the subtle, unintrusive textual ads, advertisers have an incentive to switch to those ones which wham you and take, or take us back to 2001 and pop-ups everywhere. So, I mean, I think one untalked about advantage of personalization is in some sense what the alternative is, which is something a lot more intrusive and interruptive in a different dimension. Well, you wrote a paper documenting that. Um. I just say that generally, I mean, the personalization is just incredibly value creating. 
you know, I think that's another version yeah. on what, what Catherine was saying, that like when I get you the right ad, ultimately like the advertiser, generally most advertisers don't actually want to piss you off. Mm. You know, they, but they, they, they haven't quite figured out how to, to do that. I think what, sometimes you kind of get these sort of inflection points. Um, say like, you know, in search, like it, it used to be that it wasn't really that relevant and nothing was relevant except your query. Like you could try to make things more personalized, but your query kind of trumped everything. But then as people, you know, as, as you're on a phone versus a PC and you're in a different location, suddenly that contextual information becomes more important. Mm -hmm. And at some point it, it, it can kind of be more useful. And so I think that in some sense we may, as we, we may have just not quite hit the point yet where the combination of the advertiser technology and methodology and the data available really made it useful, but it, at some point it could actually be a lot more useful. Right, and it really depends a lot on the type of ad. I mean, it's harder to add value to the search ad because you already have such information, but for if it's a run of the site ad on a general news site, then you can, there's, a huge, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot huge, of upside. Get, yeah, a gain to that. But, Let me, but, can but, I just but, sorry, yeah, mention one more thing? That we, we used to talk a lot about all the protections actually that people had. So people would say, oh, when, when, people, when advertisers and firms have all this information about you, like isn't Amazon gonna charge you more because you're rich or something? And there was actually like a ton of protection that people had against that. And you know, I used to say, like, look, if anybody wants to do anything on the search engine that would cause people to clear your cookies, that's a terrible idea. So if like if it being a new consumer gets you, you know, a discount, like that's awful, you know, because people are gonna clear their cookies and try to be a new right. consumer. So you had all these protections. But I think one interesting so I was always like, you guys are just completely off point, you're completely worried about the <laughs> wrong thing. Like, we're not gonna see firms try to screw you over with your personal information because they want your relationship mm -hmm. more than they than whatever they could get out of kind of manipulating you. But, you know, now like your phone, like you are identified. Like you can't pretend to not be your phone. Right. Um, you know, you can't just clear your cookies on your phone. Like they're they're tracking your phone ID. You can't not be you anymore. And so I, I would I, I, I while I still think that the firms, like especially the big firms, the high reputation firms, value your relationship more than anything else. And like Amazon wants to keep prices low. You know, the ability of firms to kind of use your information against you, I think, has just taken like gone into a new. Right. you know, a new era, so we need to revisit those questions. But this last point with, with the question is, is a real important issue that I want to just touch on a little more. Um, there seems like there's often a sort of a dichotomy in these two communities, one that's very focused on privacy, you use the word invasive, and then there's another community focusing on the benefits um, and targeting, and th there doesn't seem to be as much, except for in your comments just now, talking about both after, what's some of the, the best work looking at, at an integrated framework of both the costs and the benefits, and, and thinking about privacy uh, you know, what are the actual costs as opposed to the, the, you know, the, the, the psychology? Are there specific harms or economic costs or others that could be uh, balanced against the economic benefits and other sorts of benefits? Is so first of all, you, the, if I had to actually answer that, I had to do this paper for the Dutch government, um, which is on my webpage. It's just an informal paper. And when I tried to answer your question, I figured out the best place to look was Catherine's CV. Mm -hmm. So if you just go to her website, that's like 90% of the good research on this. Do you have her email address? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can read my paper that sort of surveys that. Um, I actually get asked to talk about this a lot, like this the, to be like kind of an arbiter between the two things. I'm interested yeah. in both. I do think that you know the the policy community often just does not. It's dominated by lawyers and people who, mm -hmm. with, and, right. and they don't think about the benefits, and they also don't think about the unintended consequences. Like if you make sure, if you make newspapers less able to raise money through targeted advertising, then the newspapers are going to shut down, right. and then you're going to come back the other way and start refunding them. You know, so you, you have to really think about the full circle that people need to, be, you know, new firm. You love all these websites, you love all these startups, but they have to get new customers somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, and if they can't get new customers efficiently and effectively, they don't get funded, they don't exist, they die. So I think that what's missing from the policy debate is often like the, the, you know, the full general equilibrium effects of kind of short-sighted regulation, which often doesn't even solve the problem it was trying to solve. To We're start essentially with. out of time, but we've, Susan and I have teed you up for the last comment on this. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, well that's wonderful. I'm just going to take Susan with me everywhere. She just explains <laughs> my research a lot better than me. Um, but you know, what I just say for that is I'm often in the position of being the one economist token economist on a privacy panel. And it, I cannot say the extent 
to which when I try and talk about trade-offs, I think often other people on the panel here, economists want free for all on data. So I think the more we can insert ourselves, people who are sort of empirically driven with data and information into these conversations, the more I think we can lead to that integration rather than being just like the one person who everyone's sort of a bit suspicious of and having a few jokes at. You go to Europe, okay, like I'm standing on a stage, I say the word trade-off, and the, so the you first- You didn't do that, did you say it's so? A, it's a fundamental human right to privacy. There are no trade-offs. Yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. Well, with Perfect. that, let's wrap up. Wonderful. Thank you very much, guys.